Welcome back to Tactical Insight, everyone. How do we fix this? It's only one defeat, believe it or not. I see one bad result in 12 in 2024, but it could be a damning one. It could be a, could be a hammer blow, as Robbie said, because that's what Man City do. But no time to feel sorry for ourselves, no time to give up. We need to understand what went wrong against Villa, because I found it quite difficult to really explain what went wrong. Why did the players look like they gave up? Sure, they didn't give up. That's everything this team hasn't been. So we need to look back at this game. We're going to break it down, Graham and I. We're going to talk tactics. We're going to talk a little bit about Arteta's approach with the starting 11. And we're trying to understand how we can be better for Bayern. Why maybe we have to revert to what was working so well in January, February, March, if we have to progress and get to the end of the season, at least on high, at least know that we push City as far as we can from this point onwards. Now, before we go into it, apologies that we missed the opportunity to break down a great win against Brighton. A very comfortable win against Luton, as you can see on the channel. There's been so much content coming out. I hope you can understand. But we are here for, I think, certainly feels the most important of the matches, Graham. It's always the happiest, but, you know, we always say we're here, win, lose or draw. No matter what, we are here. But we've got to fix this. How do we do it, Graham? And how are you, first and foremost? Yeah, it's great to be back, James. Yes, uh, Arsenal went into this fixture uh, knowing that title rivals Liverpool had slipped up mm. against Crystal Palace. So uh, that was one thing that happened on the day that was greeted with uh, a loud noise in the stadium when that result came through. So could Arsenal take advantage? Arsenal have been on this fantastic run. We have to remember that, where we got to uh, before this game. Uh, Ten wins and a draw going into this fixture. Uh, but we had lost at Aston Villa in the season. And Aston Villa did go into this game without the two central midfielders, Louise and Kamara. So you thought on paper this was going to be a fixture that Arsenal were going to win. But it, despite a great start, and we did start well, that first half, I think we had something like 14 shots, mm -hmm. 1.23 XG. We dominated the first half, played really well at the start of the game, mm -hmm. despite the changes, which I must admit when I got to the stadium surprised me when I saw the team line up. And the only thing that was missing in the first half, I thought, was composure in front of goal. That's the only thing. But what we're going to talk about today is how the second half began and they wrestled control away from us. And in the end, they thoroughly deserved their victory. I agree. Look, let's fly through the match stats, OK? And we'll get into the good stuff. But yes, we did have 18 shots to Villa's 11. Yes, we did have more possession. Yes, we just about completed more passes and had the slightly better XG. A lot of that work, though, done in the first half because the second half was such... Is a contradiction the word? It was just, I've never seen a game be played in one half of the pitch. That one. <laughs> Nothing ever happened in this one. Apart from Watkins sitting in the post once, I feel sorry for anyone who had a seat around here at the ground because everything happened over there. Arsenal dominated Villa and then Villa dominated us. It was such an incredible flip in tone, such an incredible flip in tactical success for either for both managers and we're going to break down why but let's just go through the attacking stats yes we had more deep completions yes we had more zone touches yes we had more touches in the opposition box but we couldn't make it count and the field tilt surprised me that it was that much in our favor because again probably the good work of the first half you know leans it that way but Villa very good in the second defensively you can see the numbers there, both teams engaging very quickly in terms of passes per defensive action and not allowing either team to settle. Now, the, tar the starting 11 you have mentioned already, and I want to go with that. For everyone who just needs a little bit of a refresher, Zinchenko started, which he came on against Bayern, I actually thought he did okay to be fair. Um, but the return of Havertz from what was a striking position into midfield to get Rice back into the six, we need to explore whether that was driven by Jorginho not being able to play so many minutes, whereas Maybe against Bayern, he felt that actually we lost something and he wants to get Havertz back. Maybe he's trying to force Jesus back into this team. Maybe he's just rotating. But what was the idea behind this change? And Trossard starting, may I say? Well, I think the idea be behind the change, I think, was... Um, and I, I, I mentioned this to you this morning. I just think he feels that he can't trust certain players to play two or three intense games in a week. And that's what it felt like to me in the stadium. We went away... I thought from what was working really well, James, and that was Havertz. If I can move him. He doesn't want to move, there we go. In this position. Yeah. So I'll just move Jesus out here, because that's where he played yeah. last week yeah. against Brighton. That was our front three last week, yeah. and Jorginho was playing there next to Rice. That, that, yeah. One thing that he's done this season, uh, Arteta, and you mentioned to me before we started about that James McNicholas tweet yeah. about... 
he's sort of uh, removed a lot of the on-field jeopardy, I think James said. Shall we read it? Yeah, it's, it's, read a great, it's a great line. It's a great tweet. And of course, my iPad's decided to refresh, but here it is. Gunner Blog, James McNicholas, of course, writer for The Athletic, said, In a season in which Arteta's worked so hard to eliminate on-field jeopardy, Zinchenko's beginning to feel like a relic of last season's more chaotic team. There's an article, really recommend you all go read it. But I think that line is so... It's perfect. Yes, and, and so what he's done this season is we've had like four centre-backs, haven't we? Four solid centre-backs. He's always been playing left-back, well, I say since, since the return. Do you know what, Graham? Let's show how that's looked. Because since we've returned from Dubai. Let's show it. And I think this right. team, I think when we got to the stadium, and I thought it was about trying to accommodate Gabriel Jesus back in the centre-forwards role, James. And that, yeah. that's what it felt like to me. This is what the team's really been. This, this is what the, this is what the Martinelli or Trossard, Martinelli, Trossard Saka, just who's yeah. out there. Yeah. Havertz has been playing here since he's gone into this position. We've been really strong, haven't we? Mm. Uh, we? We've been on this fantastic run, and he's been making goal contributions, scoring goals and assisting goals. We've had like this double pivot working really well mm -hmm. um, of With Rice, Rice and, and Odegaard, where Rice can push on. Oh right, fine. Rice can push on, but he next to Jorginho. That yeah. partnership for me has been really good in this run. Yeah. We've got the stability of the bat line yeah. and we've got Havertz holding the ball up, mm -hmm. bringing players into play. So that has been working really well for the last 10, 12 Premier League games uh, where we've been unbeaten, certainly 11, nine wins and uh, nine, 10 <coughs> wins and a draw. Mm -hmm. So that's been working really well. So you went away from that. Mm -hmm. Now when uh, Havertz played at left centre mid earlier in the season, mm -hmm. I think we lost so let's get Jorginho out. Get Jorginho out and get Rice there. Havertz yeah. there. So if you look at what we've got now, yeah. Havertz is there. Yeah. The record with him in that position is not so great. I think we've uh, lost three games and four yesterday with him there. That wasn't really the problem. I didn't think the problem with him being there was the reason we lost the game. I agree. I, I, I think we lost the game for many reasons, but clearly what we had before was working really well. Mm -hmm. So to, 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 to move that away from that, and I get the fact that he played Bayern away uh, last, uh, Bayern at home last Tuesday. We got Bayern away on Wednesday. To move away from that in this game, I, I thought was a risk. Yeah. And it seemed to me to accommodate Gabriel Jesus down the middle, who made a great cameo mm -hmm. when he came on against Bayern Munich. So the fact that he came on against Bayern Munich and played so well, mm -hmm. and he created the goal for Trossard, might have influenced his thinking. I think he did. But Jesus himself has been saying this week he's been struggling with a lot of pain in football matches, hasn't he? he doesn't he said he doesn't play in games without pain. So, and I thought his performance on the day wasn't great. I thought he, he ran out of steam quite early. He wasn't pressing as well as I've seen him press in the past. So I didn't think that worked. I think the change to the formation, uh, Jesus up top, Havertz in the left centre mid position for me, although we started the game really well, I don't think that for me, I couldn't understand why he changed it. I'll be honest with you. I agree. Let's get this 11 back up, you know, the, the, the 11 that started the game. Now, I had the same concerns as you. Um, Actually, people laughed at me about a month and a bit ago where Havertz started in midfield and I thought, oh, Arteta's, he's arteta -ing. Why is he doing this? Um, and in fairness, as I think you pointed out, when Havertz was last playing in midfield, it was more, again, Martini was wide, but he was playing really close to Trossard, more of a 4-4-2, so Erdogan was in build-up with Rice. Now, in this game, call me crazy, I know a lot of people weren't impressed by Havertz in this game. And like, obviously overall, he obviously didn't have as big an impact as he wanted. He missed some chances. I actually think for all my fears about him starting in midfield, I thought he was quite good in that first half. I really thought he was doing well to tuck in next to Declan Rice and keep it as a two. I think it gave us a, a decent foundation. There was one time where Arsenal worked the ball into this area. Let's get a ball on the pitch. And here we go. So Arsenal moved the ball. So Havertz dropped wide to receive the ball. Gives it to Trossard, and of course you've got to envisage the Villa players come across, but then he bursts forward onto a lovely ball from Trossard, and I just felt that's good midfield play, that's give me the ball because you're struggling to play out, let me give it to the wide player, let's connect the dots, I can't remember, it might not have been Zinchenko by the way, it might have been Gabriel gave it to him, and then let me drive into that space after, because I've dropped out, that no one's picked me up, and so I can make an unchallenged run into that area. And I felt that actually, for the chances he missed breaking into the penalty area, I want to be fair on him. I thought his midfield performance was actually okay. But there is something about him and this balance that has never really clicked this season. It's never really, even against Luton, where you felt the three understood each other best in that game, in the away game, we won 4-3. We still conceded three goals. We never really had control of that game of football. 
I just feel that with this 11, there are four positions in particular that I've talked about recently. And you might remember me saying this. And yeah, let's do it in blue. David, oh, there we go. Is this going to work? Yeah, there we go. David Raya, Zinchenko. I'm going to put Rice in there, but that's a touch on Farrell. I'll explain why. Gabby Jesus. Now, I felt that these positions here in recent, well, in pretty much most of 2024, Raya has started to get credit for being a calmer head in a panic situation. And he's not really saved us yet in a game, but he's generally kind of kept a cool head. Kivior coming in for Zinchenko in this role, I think has played it with not the same expansiveness and flair as Zinchenko, but he certainly just played it with almost a coldness. I keep using that word cold. I've got a job to do. Let me just keep it simple and keep things moving. Now, the reason I say it's unfair on Rice is because really he's played left eight. And with Jorginho in there, he's kept things moving and just held a position. And with Havertz up front, he is not as talented a footballer as Jesus. No one will convince me he is. But a pure footballer, technical footballer. But he holds his position well. He works the centre-backs hard. He attacks that penalty area well. And he's constantly giving the defender something to think about. And he presses well. And I think he generally just plays the game with a... I'm a striker, my job is to hold the ball up and get into the box. He's not perfect at it. But there's a clarity in these players and their positions. And I feel we regress more to last season's Arsenal, where basically it was a case of we could play really fluid, great football, but it could also look a little bit messy. And so when I look at this from Mark R. Stats, which is brilliant, and you sent this through, I look at this pass network and I think, look at Jesus, no real connections, drifting out to the right where all the football's being played. He was brilliant last season when he was combining more with the left. And then I see here, and let's show it in yellow, Zinchenko in the pass network with Trossard Rice. But n where's that? That's, that was the connection. Those were the connections last season. That made us so good. That is what made Zinchenko undroppable, it felt. Yes, you might concede opportunities. Yes, you might concede chances. But... He just gave you, he was a cheat code. You would cut through the midfield with ease because he would find Xhaka in that area and he would unlock Martinelli and Jesus would drift out. And what you had on this side, you felt you had on that side. And we have lost that this season. And it makes Zinchenko totally redundant in this team. If you go back to the teams on the... Should we go back to the tactical pad? Go back pad? to the tactical pad again, James. Two or three points I want to make, right? The first thing I'll say about Gabriel Jesus is... He's had this knee injury. I don't think yeah. he's ever been the player that he was since the knee injury. And you are right. That's a great point you make. It works better. Havertz doesn't got his talent, but yeah. one thing he has got is clarity about his role. Yeah. And he's like a focal point and he brings these uh, players into play who we rely on to create and fashion chances. It was working the way it was. Yeah. The reason I felt why Zinchenko played was simply because he didn't play Jorginho. Yeah. Jorginho gives you the control from midfield with his passing. Yeah, I think you're so, right. So basically, with... Rice going back to six, who's more an off-the-ball player. Great player, Declan Rice, but we then got Jorginho's control, so he brought Zinchenko in for control. You're right. He wanted to, sorry to interrupt you, but he wanted to. Havertz can float. We yeah. know Erdogan picks up this area, and at times it looked like a three, didn't it? Yeah. With, you know, almost like a three, yeah. three, four. Yeah, so he wanted Zinchenko for the control here. Yeah. I just thought this side looked very unbalanced on the day, and, and I think... The one thing that I noticed recently when these two have played together, and I talked to you about it before we started the show today, is I think Havertz and uh, Trossard, mm -hmm. they tend to sort of like switch positions. Yeah. And, and they don't really play. They play like two strikers. One comes short and one goes yeah. deep sort of thing. One, one goes long. So one will come inside and one will go long. And Villa, as you know, play that high line. And they mm -hmm. played that high line yesterday uh, during the game, which Emery likes to deploy and he likes to sort of clatter the centre of the pitch and make them really compact with, and with the high line to catch him. We were caught offside quite a lot of time, just over yeah. five or six times. Yeah. But I just felt that, that to bring to, he brought Zinchenko in because he didn't have Jorginho. That's the reason why he played him. He wanted to give Jorginho the rest. And I thought he tried to accommodate Jesus in the team at centre forward, which took away all the things that were working well in the previous games. Albeit... And we have to say, the first half, when you saw the way we started, we were playing really well. Mm -hmm. and, and Havertz made one great run to break the, the uh, high line. Mm -hmm. But even then, did you trust him to put the ball away no, when he got in? He never, he never goes in with any conviction. He never really uh, has a shot with any real power, does he? Mm -hmm. And it was an easy save for Martinez. 
So he's playing in this role, and he did a lot of good things, 100% right. But I think he's better here, and I don't think uh, he takes away what you can have in uh, ball progression. I think ball progression is what we lacked. We, he might have been doing lots of ni nice and tidy things off the ball and doing things, but we lacked a real ball progressor yesterday. Mm -hmm. Zinni did come in and that's the side of his game that he was good at uh, and he did play one really good through ball to Havertz to get him into a good position. So, but I just think when you don't play Jorginho you lose, or, or even Thomas Partey who's a great ball progressor, you lose a ball progressor in that area. Uh, and, and I think ultimately, although we play well, first half, 42% of our play mm -hmm. came down this right hand side. So the left hand side, you talked about that left hand side, even with Zinni on that side, I didn't think it was working that well. Most of our play was down this side. And Bakaya Saka had one or two great opportunities in the first half. Mm -hmm. But what Arsenal were really guilty of in that first half, they wasted the brilliant playmaking uh, of Martin Odegaard, who I thought was on a different level in that first half. He was. He, everything went through him. We had situations in that first half where uh, Saka was in a great position here. He should have gone back across the goal. He went for the near post. Gabriel Jesus, when the ball went across him, he has to go back across yeah, goal with right. a header and he headed for the goal and he didn't make the most of it. And then I thought the real pivotal moment in the game, this felt like a big moment, mm -hmm. is when Trossard yeah. gets in, I, I think it is, is uh, Ben White or Saka who played in through? I think it was Jesus. So oh, Erdegaard, yes. Erdegaard has, let, you know what, let's actually try show this moment because it is, so Erdegaard, I mean, not everyone's in the right position, but Erdegaard has a shot on goal and he takes a deflection. Now Jesus, it Drops falls out, to him. It? He actually takes a good touch to yeah. set himself and he puts it across goal. Now Martinez is defending the near post and when it comes to Trossard, it's straight corner but he goes back towards Martinez. As Martinez is scrambling across, he's able to save it. And He has yeah. to score that. Yeah. And, and that was it's a felt, miss. It's not it, a great it, save. It, it, it's no, a it sounds a great save. It was a good save but it's not a great save. It was, uh, Trossard really should have buried it from a few yards out. That felt like a big moment. So we wasted a lot of the things that Odegaard was doing. We were this right hand side was gelling quite well and I thought the first half we didn't take our opportunities and, and we were in control of the game. Villa, to be fair to them, they got a new centre mid partnership of Tillemans and McGinn, no yeah. Louise, no Kamara and they were being stretched all over the park uh, in that first half by, as you said, Havertz's movement yeah. and, and Odegaard but they stuck in the game and they got a very good back line, uh, Torres, Carlos, Carlos who was really brilliant. excellent on the day, Konza, I thought Zaniola was top Yeah, as well. and, and he was top. And, and I think in the first half, they were very compact. The RB and Zaniola were really tucking in a lot in that first half. And I think I'm going to talk about in the second half, the way they changed shape yeah. a bit. Let's go to that. Yeah, let, let, let's touch that, on that. That is, just, to me, that is, to me, the real key part of, of what happened. And just before we do, I can imagine a lot of you maybe are listening to this going, guys, you're talking about Havertz and the change and Zinchenko, but ultimately should have been 3-0 up half time. Trust me, I totally agree. But it's not always about the amount of chances you have and the amount you attack or whatever. Sometimes there's a temperament, sometimes there's a, a professionalism you're looking for. And Arsenal looked so far from what we looked at Brighton, where we looked so controlled or we looked so clear in what we wanted to do. I felt we really lacked that in this game. And in that first half, despite I agree, Havertz did some nice things. Trossard should have scored. We had three or four great chances. Saka, I thought, had a better first half than people probably gave him credit for. There was something about Arsenal that just felt a little bit erratic, which is why we talked about all that. Now, it's worth saying, for the thing we've just said, this great sat, stat, set of stats here uh, that Jesus and Havertz, with 10 starts and 7 starts for Kai, have very different win percentages, with Havertz and Arsenal winning 86% of games when Kai started up front. He's also got 2.9 goals per game to Jesus' 1.9 goals per game. So there is evidence to suggest that when Kai Havertz starts up front, Arsenal just simply have a better control and system that is able to get the three points. Martin Erdegaard in that first half was scintillating as well. I don't want... And I know people go, great, a first half, it's about 90 minutes. When you're that good, don't expect a top manager like Una Emery not to do something about it. So they tried to cut him out of the game in that second half, and you're going to talk about what they did. But I wouldn't blame him for looking at other players on the pitch and going, everyone, I'm doing what I can. Can anyone help me? Can anyone bail me out? Can anyone else create a chance? Can anyone else you know, get us playing through the lines. Because it was all on Martin Erdogan. I felt so sorry for him. I genuinely thought it was the best 45 minutes I've seen from an Arsenal player this season. 
he was scintillating. Some of his numbers, he won 100% of his tackles, he had 88% pass actually, creating two chances, having two shots, two dribbles, and had one key pass as well. I fe- he did not deserve to be on the losing team. Everyone else, debate it, but Erdegaard didn't. He was magnificent. Yeah, absolutely brilliant first half. Not just in the chances he created, uh, but also his work rate. Mm-hmm. There was one incident where he charged down one as a corner, uh, yeah. and, uh, you know, stopped them from breaking out. He had a fantastic uh, game yesterday, and it was a bit like the Odegaard pre-Christmas, where he was putting up trees for us and getting us in good positions, and we just couldn't take advantage of all his, all his good play. Like that it was game, a yeah. perfect demonstration for me of playmaking from our, our captain. He and needs help, though. We need another. If yeah. Rice is going to be a ball-winning number six that starts as the defensive mil- midfielder for us for the next five, ten years, that you need another right-footed Erdogan. Now, now that's a video for another day, <laughs> but we, it can't, he cannot be our prime source of creativity. And I felt Georgina took the weight off him a little bit in this spell, but mm. yeah. Anyway, Erdogan magnificent. What did Villa do? Help me, Graham. I don't understand it. How did the game, like I mentioned, went, go from what felt like a 100% field tilt <laughs> to a game in which we could not even ask a question of Emi Martinez. What happened? Well, I think the first half, we had control. We, yeah. uh, even with Jorginho not in the number six role, we had control of the game. And we were dominating the game, winning our duels and getting in good positions and playing good football. Mm. And we just weren't taking our chances and we lacked composure when we got into the final third. So Villa really stayed in the game. That's what they had to do. They defended well. The two midfielders worked awfully hard. Diaby and Zaniola were literally sort of holding the compactness of this sort of like yeah. tight shape they had. There was a definite shift though at the start of the second half and it came really, I thought, they wrestled back the initiative, I thought, from the technical quality they've got and the way they started playing yeah. out from the back. Mm-hmm. They are a team who always play out from the back, of course, and what Arsenal tend to do is that Arsenal will strangle teams, stop them from getting out. So you'll yeah. get, Arsenal will get high up the pitch, yeah. Normally it's Odegaard and, uh, and, the, and the striker pressing yeah. and the two players out wide yeah. and as you'll see is Arsenal push up the pitch and literally, yeah, frequently it's, it's a 3-2-5 a or a 2-3-5 but what we do, we simply do not let teams get out James, we, yeah. s- we strangle them and that's what we did in the first half the Villa and so when they were trying to play out we were uh, winning, winning the ball back more and getting back into some good positions to start attacks. They, apart from that one moment where Watkins hit the inside of the post in the first half, Villa offered nothing really going forward after that first moment when Watkins had a header that went over onto the top of the net. So we were strangling in that first half. What changed in the second half was whether Arsenal dropped off in their pressing or what, but they started in that first 10 minutes with their technical quality of playing out. They started playing round us and we were struggling to stop them progressing it into midfield. All of a sudden, I, I noticed the momentum shift while well, sitting straight away, start of the second half, these uh, defensive players and Martinez were getting through our press and getting McGinn and Tillemans on the ball. Rogers was playing up off Watkins, of course, and Rogers did some good work in the game as well. So there was a definite shift due to their technical quality, which we struggled to lose control in the game in that first 10 minutes, I felt, because they started to play around our press and mm-hmm. get forward. And then they were doing something in the start of the second half they weren't doing in the first half. They started to uh, get free from the shackles that we put on them in the first half. We suffocated them in the first half, but they broke it. And Their started technical the second quality half. got technical better. Technical quality. They, 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 just, they, were, they, they were just good played players. out better. They, they, they played out better, mm-hmm. and that started to give them a bit more confidence. And these two players, Tillemans and McGinn, started having an influence on the game. Now, we haven't got what I would call, uh, they've got two proper midfielders in there. Yeah. Uh, we've got Havertz, who's not really a midfielder, mm-hmm. playing there. And I'm not digging him out to say he's the reason why we lost the midfield, but I'm just saying they've got two midfielders and they started to get more confident in the game. And I thought, really, that after about 10 minutes of the second half, there was a momentum shift. Mm-hmm. They started to sort of like wrestle it back towards them, away from us. Now, did Arteta wait too long to make his substitutions? That's the first thing, because I didn't think Jesus, who was obviously pressing with Odegaard, I, I didn't think that he was... Um, he did nothing, let's be honest. Yeah. He wasn't he, an he, outlet, he, no. we weren't able to go no. to the top, he couldn't, the ball wouldn't And I think he had yeah. to come off. And I, and I think, what I would have done at the start of that, and I said this to you this morning, this is not a hindsight call, I said it in the stadium yesterday, because uh, I noticed the shift straight away, James. Noticed that they were getting on top, uh, I would have hooked 
just do straight away. And I would have tried to go back to what we were doing well in previous games. I would have moved Havertz here. I would have taken Jesus off. Mm -hmm. So if you take him yeah, off, let's, do it. let's, let's, let's make some changes. Yeah. Martinelli, yeah? So who you looking I would have bought Martinelli for Trossard, and I think that was a move that, that really to try and stretch him because they were playing a higher line. Yeah. And I would have put Havertz here where he, he, he uh, has been having a lot of success as a striker. And I think we had to... Uh, Jorginho? Jorginho, because what Villa were also doing, and this is a point I forgot to mention, was that when they started to wrestle back the initiative, they started to get control of the midfield. What Emery did one thing quite clever. In the first half, he had his two wide players tucked in more, mm -hmm. but what he asked them to do, when they started to get a grip on the game, he asked the RB to come out here and Zaniola to come out here to put a bit of pressure on Ben White. Mm -hmm. right? So he's now started to stretch them out more because they've, they've started to play around the press and they're getting on the ball and they're starting to create problems. We've lost control and basically, you know, we are more open as a result of that. So he had to try and get back control. And I think the way he could have done it was to bring on Jorginho next to Declan Rice to get them closer together against uh, these two midfielders, McGinn, McGinn and Tillemans, to try mm -hmm. and get some control back mm -hmm. to stop them getting, at, getting out to their wide players. Now, Sinchenko for me would have had to have come off and I would have brought Tommy Asu not to replace Ben White. I know he was on a yellow card, but yeah. I, I trust Ben White, and I would have left White on, and I would have brought on Tommy, and I would have played him at left back to try and... Yes. Yeah. Because obviously this is their danger. They, they play Watkins up front. He's like an outlet, and he's got pace. But Diaby and Bailey managed that right side. Yeah. And I just think we needed a better defender, because they made it a sort of game. In the first half, Zinchenko was coming into midfield a lot and influencing play, James. In the second half, he wasn't doing it, and they turned it into sort of like where Zinchenko became the left back. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So when he becomes the left back, he's everything that they want and what we probably don't want. And then they started to have a bit of joy. So I think that the momentum shift from being able to play out, round us, getting their midfield on it, stretching their wide players out, that's where we started to struggle. And he didn't react quick enough for me. I think, I remember a manager, this is about 10 years ago, so sorry for a really poor reference. I wish I could say the manager in the game. But I just remember a match of the day, a manager once said, they were playing with a 4-4-2, they were losing the game, they actually reverted to a 4-5-1 and they won it. And when they were asked about it, he said, we're losing the midfield battle. So I had to get someone back in there to get control of the game. Now, why am I mentioning that? Sometimes I think people think to win a game of football, get momentum, get more attacking players on the pitch, get more possession-based players on the pitch. I think Arteta failed to recognise that. Let me say this. The players let him down first half. The tactics worked. We were cutting through them all the time. We should have had three or four goals. They should have put that ball in the back of the net. Arteta can't make that happen. And he said himself, didn't he? We should have been five up at yeah. half time. Yeah. So he would be vindicated, James. Yeah, exactly. He would have been vindicated yeah. in his 11. Everything we've said, yeah. Yeah. he'd have been vindicated. Had that happened, we wouldn't be questioning his Exactly. Election. But what he failed to recognise, in my opinion, was that to get a foothold back in the game, we actually needed to stop Villa first. Yeah. It was about taking two steps back yeah. to be able to take maybe three, four yeah. forward. Yeah. And so with this change, which I, I can sort of understand that Ben White was on a yellow card, has been playing through injury, it's been widely reported. So cool, you want to get Tommy Asu on because actually there's a good battle here with Zaniolo. But then you reach a recognise then you get Tommy Asu and Kivior on. He needed to return to a back four that was stable. He needed to tell the whole team, forget the press, they're playing around you. Drop back, get into a shape for five, ten minutes, frustrate them, and then Martinelli and Saka, see if you can just find a run. But now they're their, uh, their high line is phenomenal. They always catch teams offside. But we almost needed to go, all right, play like the away team for 10 minutes. And what I think happened for so much of that second half, I think we did a lot of... I'm trying to find the words to explain it properly because it, it might sound like I'm contradicting myself, but I, I'm not, so bear with me, everyone. We were dropping into a shape almost reactively, not proactively. It was almost like oh, they've played round us, they've entered our half, so let's return into a shape, deal with it, and then let's try to get on the ball. And then when Amy Martins gets the ball, let's try press. And let's try keep playing our football, but they kept playing around us, so we kept returning into a shape. I think we need to recognise the press isn't working, we don't have control here, let's just regress for five, ten minutes, get into a shape, frustrate them a little bit in possession as they try maybe force a pass, get in behind, we deal with it, 
and get a platform back in this game. Exactly, and yeah. I felt we spent the whole yeah. second half reacting to the fact, oh, our plan's not working. Oh, our plan's not working. Oh, we can't get the ball. Oh, we're not. And then before you know it, it's the 85th minute. You're one goal behind and you're like, we never reacted to what Villa were doing. And sometimes you've got to humble yourselves, go back into a shape, recognise they've done something and build your way back into it. And we never did. Yeah, I don't think um, taking off uh, Trossard uh, and Jesus and uh, just moving Havertz up here and bringing Jorginho on was a defence, would have been a defensive move at all. It would have, it yeah, would have, I agree. First of all, it would stop them because what you had to do is they were building up momentum and mm. we needed to wrestle that momentum back. And what you sometimes yeah. have to do in games is when that's happening, you need to sort of like get a grip of it and change the momentum back your way. And that's what I think we needed to do in that second half. Um, we yeah. didn't do that, of course. Um, he made some changes. He, he brought on Martinelli, obviously came on for Trossard. Um, Smithrow came on. A lot of people thought that Odegaard was hooked because he wasn't because he faded, but he uh, was carrying. An, uh, he felt something, I think. Uh, Arteta well, he said, "Better be okay." So, so we Sm need him. Smithrow came on for Odegaard. I didn't think that move worked at all. I didn't think no. Smithrow had one of his better little cameos. He ducked a couple of fifty-fifties for me, and he was the last man when Watkins went through to score their second goal. Um, obviously, he did go with Havertz. Did go up the middle with. Saka and Martinelli, and then we had, uh, uh, of course, Jorginho did come on, but that was our 67th to 70th minute, yeah. and by then they were in control of the game. Uh, I think he had to react far earlier, and also I think he didn't have, obviously Zinni was by now struggling on this side against uh, Bailey, who mm. ultimately got their first goal. Um, so I think he, we made the changes, but I, I, I think by then the momentum was firmly in there, going their way. It should have done it about 10, 15 minutes earlier. Yeah, fair enough. Now, look, we're not going to break it down, but just very quickly on the goal as we wrap up the show. We've just got the positions of the players here. For me, it's very, very simple. This area of the pitch, you've got to control it. It's that six-yard box. You just have to. And when this ball, and I very specifically position the play. This isn't, oh, let's roughly get into position. Havertz should be blocking that cross. Now, I've actually done a disservice. He's slightly like this. Dini has managed to dig it almost around Havertz. Havertz has got the position to stop that cross. So while I gave him credit in the first half, that's not good enough. When it comes into the box here, you either want Raya to claim, but Pal Torres attacks the front post. Gabriel's sort of wrestling with him and it comes across. But it's actually Saliba who's got the run on Torres. Pal Torres, when it comes in, I think Saliba's got to get himself there and deal with it. It might get messy, but just bodies in the way. Don't lose this game. Declan Rice got some criticism for what he said at full time when he said, um, he said, if you're not going to win the game, don't, don't lose, lose it. it. A lot yeah. of people said, what kind of mentality is that? He's absolutely right. Yeah. At least get points on the board. Yeah. If you're going to play that badly, at least dig in and recognise this. something's gone wrong this second half, but let's not lose this game. So he's not wrong. But you've got to sometimes think that way. You can't win every game. Not every day is going to be your day. Saliba should have dealt with it here, but of course it comes across the box. And the problem is, as it comes to Bailey here, who puts it into you know, the net because Raya can't get back across, it's the fact that Declan Rice is here because we've not reacted and got back into our shape after I think Tommy Asu headed out from a corner or a yeah, I mean, short corner comes into the box. Yeah. And they make their way and we never... Re you know, look, look, have us a right back. Zinchenko's at right centre mid covering. Gabriel and Saliba have swapped and Declan Rice is at left back. It's a mess. And I guess sometimes you have to just cover each other when defending a set piece. Yeah. But... I, it, it, you know, that's not great. It's the 85th minute, you have to remember that, and it comes from a corner, that's why Zinchenko's over here. We don't get our structure back, no. so they catch us out really was a bit unstructured from the corner. I would say, I don't blame Raya for it at all, because when he puts the cross in... Yeah, uh, should we open it back yeah, up? Yeah, if you open it back up. Yeah. So Havertz, uh, you say, should really block the cross, probably doesn't do enough to block the cross. Yeah. But once it comes in, because Torres makes a movement to the to this side, Raya is watching him come across. So he's, he can't make a reaction straight away. He's waiting to see what Torres does. So Torres goes with Gabriel. Saliba doesn't quite react quickly enough. And I, and I know you're sort of saying what Declan Rice might have seen. He's really watching Watkins. He's got Bailey. Could Martinelli have sort of like come back here? Dropped in to Dropped help. in there to pick up Bailey. Uh, look, in the way Saka so often does for look, White. I mean, but I don't question his work rate. No, and, maybe, and, and I don't question his work rate. It's the 85th minute and uh, we were just caught out, yeah. unstructured, and, and they took advantage. Uh, mm. And then after that, of course, it's 
they then hit us again with a, a, a goal over the top. Ironically, that we were unable to play over the top of their high press, but they got one over ours, but Watkins the ran away oh, and put the second goal in. Maybe. So in the end, you have to credit Uno Emery. Uh, yeah, he came did. to the Emirates uh, and, and he did a job on us. And, and basically in the end, obviously it's a massive blow now to our title hopes, James. Absolutely, but it's not all over as Graham gets up the, uh, the roundup stats to finish off the show. It's not over, but Arsenal may need to be perfect between now and the season if we even have a chance. Um, but the big thing is Bayern Munich. You know, Lee says something forever Arsenal, I absolutely agree with. The funny thing about cup competition football is it's always in your hands. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter what others do, it's about beating what's in front of you. And Arsenal have an opportunity against Bayern Munich. Let's hope they get it done. The roundup stats. Yeah, just a couple of games uh, on a sad day for the team yesterday. But I will say one thing, I'm still very proud of this group, very proud of yes, the team, I very proud of the manager, what we've achieved this year. So although we've obviously today questioned some of the tactics, questioned the changes he made, I, I don't want that to deflect from the fact that, you know, what he's achieved this season with this group of players. And I think uh, this group is going to get better and we're, we're getting better every season. So I will I say agree. that, first of all, with the closing stats for this week, Aston Villa, who have kept just one clean sheet in their previous nine Premier League games, did the double over Arsenal this season without conceding a goal, James. Nice. They, they beat us 1-0 at Villa the Park. The chance we had in both uh, games as well. 2-0 yesterday, yeah. Their two goals came from their only two shots on target, James. Can you think of the team last year did a double over us? Uh, two teams have done a double over us in the last two seasons. Aston Villa... You, you're right, mate. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking. <laughs> Aston, Aston Villa, and who did it last year? Who, who obviously would do it? Man City. Man City, yeah. Man City did us last year, 3-1 at home and 4-1. 4-1 yeah. at, the, at the Etihad yeah, and 3-1 at yeah. home. And they did a double overs last year. Yeah. Villa did a double overs this year. They're the only two teams who've done double overs in the last two years. Uh, it ended, uh, Villa's victory yesterday ended Arsenal's 11-game unbeaten run going into the game in the Premier League. It was 10 wins and one draw. Fantastic run coming to an end. Finally, James, on a disappointing day for Arsenal, just went in the, on a one positive thing, and that is Granit Xhaka won the Bundesliga title uh, as Leverkusen ended Bayern Munich's 11-year dominance in the Bundesliga. So can Arsenal end Bayern's Champions League campaign on Wednesday? I think that's got to be the challenge now, James. Absolutely. We hope they can. I think they can. Previews, of course, will be coming out on the channel tomorrow. This has been a really extensive look at the game uh, because I think we had to understand it. I think there's been a lot of, rightly so, frustration and venting about what happened. I've been a big part of that. But I wanted to get some clarity on what went wrong. And I think we need a little bit of clarity going to the buying game as to what we may need for that. Arteta knows best, we think, we hope. Um, but he's got a massive opportunity to not just against Bayern, but then win on the weekend. If we come through this week, top of the table, because City, of course, have a cup game, and in the semi-final of the Champions League, the season and the hope starts to feel very, very different. So you keep going to the end. And then you see where you are, but you leave it all out there, Arsenal. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this video. Big thanks to Graham as always for his fantastic work. And all of you in the comment section below, we always love to read your comments and get your thoughts. We'll be back for a special tactical insight on Thursday to review the Bayern game. Hopefully it's a win, but either way, we'll look at our Champions League campaign in full. Big, big thank you. Catch you soon.